Chapter 21 The weather began to warm, and the days started to lengthen. Soon it was time to plough. There was a team of oxen and a plough owned by the abbey that was used by the tenants, so Iada's family had to wait their turn, but even before ploughing they spent time preparing the field by removing debris, pulling weeds, and spreading compost. Yadith and Gunhild each got to try the plough, and conceded that it was difficult, but proved they could at least make a straight furrow from one end of the field to the other. Then came planting and watering, and chasing birds away from morning until night. Even on Sunday they couldn't rest. Sprott stayed home from mass, chasing off the sparrows who would eat the seeds. It was exhausting work. Although it was Boya who had promised to build Alfred and Duna's new house, Winston, Leofwine, and Alfred himself all helped. They had to borrow saws and draw knives, as they didn't own these tools themselves. They started by clearing a rectangle on the ground, digging down a foot or so, then cutting logs to serve as a frame around the edge. Then they sank six posts into the ground, after charring the outsides to keep them from rotting. Once the posts and roof beams were up, they wove willow strips through the posts, and then caked them in mud and straw. Yadith, Gunhild, and Sprott did most of this job, and they found it more fun than they had thought they might. They got filthy, and after they had finished the walls, used the extra mud for a mud fight. The roof was thatched in time for Palm Sunday, a week before Easter. A priest from the abbey agreed to officiate, most of the monks were not also priests, and Alfred and Duna were married. Gunhild found herself rejoicing with the rest of the family. She had known Duna for only five months, but having lived so closely beside her, she couldn't help but share her happiness. A wedding on Palm Sunday was a cause for great celebration. Neighbors came to wish the new couple well. Alfred's father had managed to get a sheep to roast, and people ate, drank, and sang songs around an outdoor fire. Yadith convinced Gunhild to play her lyre, and some people took turns improvising poetry as she did. Yadith and three other girls held hands in a circle and did a dance Gunhild had never seen before. She looked happy, Gunhild thought. As Gunhild sat and watched the feasting and dancing by firelight, a thought occurred to her. Yadith might never have this if she didn't get married. I'm always going to be the outsider, Gunhild thought, but that shouldn't stop Yadith from being happy. Maybe she's better off without me. She toyed with the thought for a while, trying out how it felt in her mind. Yadith loved it in this village. Did she really mean it when she said she didn't want a husband? Yadith's life would certainly be more normal with Gunhild gone. But what would that mean for her if she left? Gunhild started to imagine the deep blue sea swells that rose and fell past the edge of the bay. One thing that came with the spring was the arrival of new boats in Strayanshal. Traders would land their boats near the abbey and unload goods. Once, while delivering their weekly quota of firewood to the abbey, Yadith and Gunhild saw a man in a green tunic and a red cloak with two boys assisting him. Their boat was down on the beach, and they had carried bales of linen cloth up the trail that led to the abbey gates. The man had a felt hat and a silver chain around his neck. He wasn't a thane, but he clearly had money. A monk at the gate of the abbey received the cloth and inspected it, and made marks on a wax tablet he was holding. Yadith turned to leave as soon as the monks acknowledged their firewood, but Gunhild was fascinated by the cloth and the people who were delivering it. She stayed and watched as the monk agreed to payment and counted out silver coins. She wondered if the order had been prearranged, or whether this boatman traveled from port to port looking for buyers. She wondered where he came from, and where he would go next. She got her chance to find out one day, as she was out fishing on her own. The cod had been more active in the bay recently, and she had a decent catch that day. As she stood on the beach at the side of the boat, cleaning the fish, a boat with a square sail approached, and as it grew closer, she could see two men in it. They pulled up beside her as she finished cleaning the cod and loading them in a sack to take home. "'Good fish!' called one of the men. At first she thought it might be some kind of strange greeting, then she realized it was a compliment. Thank you, she said. Where come you from? Frankia, said the man. He and his partner hopped out of their boat and pushed it up the beach. It was filled with wooden casks. You are not English? 
asked Gunhild. We are not, confirmed the man, and Gunhild could tell by his accent that he wasn't. What bring you? she asked. She walked closer to their boat. What is in the... she paused, not knowing the word for cask. Do you trade here? Both men smiled, happy to make conversation. We bring wine to the abbey, said the other man. He slapped one of the wooden casks approvingly. The two men were strong, but didn't carry themselves as warriors did. They had knives at their sides, but no swords. Gunhild wondered if they might be brothers. Both had beards cropped short and shoulder-length hair. She noticed decoration on their woolen clothes, a pin for one and a fancy belt buckle for the other. She could tell also that they were well-fed. They conferred for a bit, then one of them walked up the beach toward the gates of the abbey, and the other took a skin bag of water and a piece of dried fish out of the boat and sat on the sand to wait. "'Where comes the wine from?' she asked. Gunhild realized that she wasn't self-conscious about her English any more. The Frank didn't speak perfectly either, so he wouldn't notice her mistakes, or at least he wouldn't care. "'The Rhone,' said the man, "'comes from very far, this wine. They don't have wine much in your country, I think.' Uh, not much grapes? That sounded correct to Gunhild, though she didn't know. She had never tasted wine and never eaten a grape, but she knew what wine was, of course. Uh, the monks at the abbey, she said. They like wine? This got a laugh from the man. Oh, they love wine. Where get you wine to, to bring it here? Uh, we buy at Dorstad, he explained. We fill the boat and come north to Hagastaldesham, Wearmouth, Strayonshal. We sell for silver, and then go to Yoverwich, and buy wool or cloth, and take back to Dorestad. They buy wool and cloth in Dorestad? asked Gunhild. They like English wool, said the man. Have you traveled much? Gunhild didn't know the word traveled. The Frank saw her confusion, but seemed to assume that he had gotten the word wrong himself. He gestured with his hand to mime a boat on the water. Have you gone far away? he asked. Not to Dorestad, she said. How go you there? He seemed unsure what kind of an answer she wanted. South, he said simply. She could see the other man returning with a handcart. She wanted to know more, but wasn't sure what to ask. She really wanted to know how it all worked, how someone could know what to buy where and for how much, but she knew she couldn't keep them from their delivery. As the men loaded the handcart with casks, she had an idea. Would you like some fish to eat? she asked. I can cook while you're at the abbey. The Frank whom she had been talking to paused. That is kind, but why give us you your fish? I have more questions, she said. It turned out that their names were Bernhard and Hartmut, and they were indeed brothers, as they ate the fish that Gunhild had roasted on the coals of the hastily built fire she had made. They told her all about the different ports they had been to. They had bought lead and tin from Cornwall, beef from Ireland and pottery from Mainz. They had delivered cargo to Lundenwich and Paris and Aachen. They drew rough maps in the sand, and Gunhild for the first time started to get a picture of where things were in relation to each other. They traced rivers, the Tyne, the Thames, the Sinn and the Rhine, and showed towns and cities along each. They talked about how lords, abbots, or even kings would sometimes promise payment upon delivery for some particular goods they needed. Gunhild soaked it up trying to fix the map in her head, trying to make sure she asked all her questions while she still had the chance. She had a plan forming, and this was her best chance to get the details. For the next few days, Gunhild seemed distant and distracted. There was plenty of work to do. The shoots of wheat were just beginning to show, and weeds could choke them out if given the chance. Gunhild worked steadily, but seemed off in her own world. She was imagining Lundenwich, and Paris, and Aachen, and trying to figure out the best way to get there and make some money on the way. Eventually, she couldn't keep her idea to herself anymore. One day, while she and Yadith were picking stones and weeds from the wheat field side by side, she brought it up. She spoke in Danish still to Yadith whenever they were alone together. I was thinking of taking a trip, she started. Where? asked Yadith. Yoverwich, I think. I hear it's a good place to buy and sell things. I thought I could fill the boat with cargo and take it to Lundenwich or Dorstad and sell it, then bring something back to Yoverwich. She looked at Yadith to gauge her reaction, but Yadith remained focused on the ground in front of her. What do you think? Gunhild asked. I thought you would want to leave eventually, said Yadith. 
It's not that I want to leave, said Gunhild quickly. I just thought... Haven't you ever wanted to see the rest of the world? Just think about going to Paris someday, or Rome. And you would come back after seeing them? asked Yadith. I guess, Gunhild answered. I mean, who knows what it could lead to? I met these two traitors, and one of them, Bernhard, said that he heard the city of Constantinopolis has two huge walls around it, and a moat beyond that, and that ox carts and camels and elephants come in and out all day. That sounds like leaving to me, muttered Yadith. You could come, said Gunhild excitedly. Two salt sisters, just like you said. Yadith straightened her back and turned to look at Gunhild. They need me here. Look at this field. Mother can't do this work. The baby is due soon. I can't just run away. I'm not running away, said Gunhild. I didn't say you were, said Yadith, but I can't go. You go on, see the world. I knew... I knew you couldn't stay. Gunhild watched Yadith turn back to the ground in front of her and move further down the row of wheat. I'll come back, she promised. You might, conceded Yadith. Gunhild wanted to keep talking about her plans, but could tell that the conversation wouldn't go well from here. Yadith was the only one she could really talk to, though, so Gunhild was stuck with her own thoughts. The rest of the day passed in chores. That evening the family sat around the hearth, Yadith uncharacteristically withdrawn. There was some food left over from the midday meal of mushy peas and flatbread, and Yadlu shared it among the women. Leofine and Winston declined, though Gunhild assumed they must be hungry too. Late spring was a difficult time for food. Although crops were growing, and they were growing well this year, there wouldn't be more wheat until the harvest, which was months away. The chickens were too valuable to eat unless one of them stopped laying. The fish that Gunhild contributed from time to time had ended up being quite valuable to the family, though Gunhild sometimes couldn't bring in much of a catch despite her best efforts. Eventually, without saying anything, Yadith got up and left the house. Gunhild watched her leave, then followed after and walked with Yadith silently as they made a wide circle around the garden and the fields. "'What will you use to buy your cargo?' Yadith asked suddenly. She stopped walking and turned to face Gunhild. "'I... I was working on that,' said Gunhild. "'I could trade something for it,' I thought, "'but I don't really have anything. "'I thought maybe your family could... "'Maybe you could help me start with something.' Yadith's expression flashed anger. My family? We barely have enough to eat. Name one thing we could do without. One thing we could give up and not miss. I'm sorry, said Gunhild. Maybe I could catch a lot of fish. Maybe you could, said Yadith, and Gunhild wasn't quite sure what she meant. Silence hung between the two girls as Yadith glowered and Gunhild tried to think what to say. Look, I don't have to go, said Gunhild. Of course you do, shouted Yadith. I know you do. This isn't your home. You said so. She began to cry. Gunhild reached out to hug her, and Yadith pushed her away. Thank you for bringing me home, continued Yadith. You have done your duty. You've fulfilled your promise. Now go live the rest of your life. Go see Rome and find a husband and get rich. So you want me to go? I want you to be happy, said Yadith, and you're clearly not happy here. It's not that I'm not... Gunhild began but she didn't finish. I'm so grateful to you and your family. Yadith glared at her, but remained silent. I guess I'll go tomorrow, Gunhild suggested. If that's what you want, said Yadith. She turned back toward the house, and Gunhild again reached out for her. Yadith knocked her hand back and walked off, and Gunhild was left to wait in the waning daylight. It was settled now, she decided, and there was no reason to wait. She would leave at dawn. The next morning, Gunhild announced her plan to the family and thanked them for their hospitality. They seemed surprised to see her leave so suddenly, but they wished her well and gave her some bread to take with her. She took a knife and some flint in a small leather bag, as well as a water skin. Madwin insisted that she take a cloak and warm hat. She hugged each of them in turn, but when she looked to find Yadith, she noticed that she had slipped out of the house. She stepped outside and looked around, but Yadith was gone, and Gunhild realized she wasn't planning on being found. 
Knowing that searching for her would only lead to more angry words, Gunhild waved again to the family and set off with her lyre over her shoulder. It was a short walk to the beach and her boat, and as Gunhild walked, she thought of what she wished she could say to Yada. That she would miss her. That she would be back some day. As she readied the boat and rowed out past the breakers, though, her thoughts turned again to busy ports and distant lands. And as the wind caught the sail and she turned the boat southward, she felt her heart jump at the thought of adventure. Once she was out of sight of Strandshall, she set to planning her next steps. The water in the water skin should last her to Yoverwich. She ran over the route in her mind, remembering how she would need to go south about a hundred miles, then turn up the river Humber. She would recognize it, she knew, from the stone church on a long spit of land that stretched into the mouth of the river. She had enough food for a day, but she decided to fish while she sailed and save as much bread as she could, so she threw the net overboard to see what she might catch out on the ocean. As she sailed, she became aware of a strange feeling. She was now completely alone in a way she had never been before. She was also utterly, unnervingly free. For her entire life, leading up to this point, what she did and where she went was influenced by someone else. At home, she hadn't gotten to make decisions for herself, and after leaving, her only goal had been to get to safety. Later, at Strayonashal, Yadith's family had never resigned her a job, but her choice of activities was limited, and each day was bound by patterns of sunrise and sunset, of work and rest, that carried her, the family, and the whole village through the days and seasons and years. Farming did not lend itself to freedom, she mused. A farmer had to listen to the seasons, the weather, the animals. Now, though, she could do anything, sail in any direction, stop and start as she pleased. All the same, she was living dangerously, and she knew it. If she got injured, if she got lost, if the weather turned bad, there would be no one to save her. She felt as if she were standing on the edge of a cliff, surveying a vast and wild landscape. It was huge and beautiful, and knowing that she was only a step away from danger made it all the more thrilling. She was snapped out of her reverie by a tug at the net, and when she pulled at it to check it, she realized she had something big. She began to haul the net in, and soon she saw she had caught a giant codfish that now wriggled and thrashed in the net by the side of the boat. It was at least as long as her arm, and felt as if it might weigh fifty pounds. It was a struggle even to get it into the boat, and once it was in, it kept fighting. Gunhild had to straddle it while she dispatched it with her knife, and even after she had cleaned it and thrown the entrails over the side, she struggled to lift it. It was beautiful, and the biggest fish she had ever caught. She wished she could show Yarath or her uncle Ivar, but this fish would have to be hers alone, both the meat of it and the memory. It would easily last her until Yoverwich. A light rain blew through that afternoon, but she kept sailing, and the sky was clear by nightfall. She put in at a sandy beach and built a fire, and pulled off her cloak and woolen overdress to dry them on a tripod of sticks that she made by the fire. The night wasn't too cold, and she sat on the edge of the boat and played her lyre as the fish cooked. There was no one else for miles. In fact, she was farther away from any other people than she had ever been in her life. She was filled with the urge to whoop as loudly as she could. She threw her head back and tried it, and her voice joined the crashing waves and the sound of the wind in the beach grass. She howled like a wolf and bellowed like a giant and sang a song for the crickets and owls, and after she ate, she stretched out in the sand next to the fire and covered herself with her cloak. She arrived at the mouth of the Humber the next day and sailed upstream. There were boats on the river, and she called out to the other sailors and waved. She used the English greeting, Wasadu Hal, meaning be well, and found people were happy to wave back at her. 
She passed villages and sometimes stopped to ask whether she had reached Yoverwich, but people continually waved her further upstream, and it took another night's rest and a day of sailing before she reached it. The river branched, and she sailed up the river Ouse, past fishermen at their weirs and women washing clothes. When she finally did sail around a bend in the river and saw the city of Yoverwich, she was amazed. She thought Ripa had been big, but it was nothing compared to this. The first thing she saw was the city walls. They were beyond imagination. How many people must live here to build walls like that? How long must it have taken? The city lay on both sides of the river, and the walls surrounded it, allowing the river to pass through the center. Houses were packed close together along wooden walkways, and wooden piers reached into the river. Boats were docked along the piers, and traders loaded and unloaded their cargo. Gunhild could see vendors with wares set up on tables and blankets, and from somewhere the smell of roast pork was carried in on the breeze. Gunhild lowered the sail and used the oars to maneuver her boat to a spot at one of the piers, and by the time she had tied up a large man had approached and asked her business. "'I trade,' she said. "'I buy cargo.' "'It's a penny to dock here,' said the man, sounding bored. Gunhild realized she should have planned for this. "'I have no money,' she said. "'Then you can dock somewhere else,' said the man. "'Can I pay tomorrow?' she asked. Now the man looked annoyed. Before he could answer, Gunhild began untying the rope from the pier. "'I go, I go,' she said. "'I'm sorry.' She rowed back down the river and found a place to leave the boat outside the city, tied to a small tree along the muddy bank. She finished the rest of the cod and drank some water. She thought about refilling her water skin, but she noticed that the river didn't look too clean here, so she slung her lyre across her back and walked back to the city. She hadn't been expecting so much noise. There were voices everywhere, and the sound of animals, too. A blacksmith was hammering somewhere, which blurred into the background of shouts, arguments, laughter, and conversation. She wandered past vendors, selling everything she could imagine. Shoes, cups, and bowls, knives, linen, sausages. One large man in a red tunic had stacks of woolen cloth tended by two other men. He was in heated conversation with another man she recognized from another boat at the pier. She tried listening in on their conversation to get a sense of how buying and selling worked, but it was hard for her to understand. Her plan wasn't completely developed yet, but what she really wanted to find was something rare but easy to transport. Maybe something that was made nearby, but that would be hard to find somewhere else. Buying ordinary items, she reasoned, wouldn't be useful. People made shoes and belts in every trading port around the world, she was sure. She needed something special. Because of this, she took her time, browsed patiently, and asked about price every once in a while to try to get a sense of what things were worth. As she moved deeper into the city, she came upon the church and was again awestruck. It was as big as a king's hall, but built of stone. It seemed impossible to even consider building anything so big out of stone, and yet here it stood, and people walked past it as if it were normal. Gunhild approached it, and no one warned her away. In fact, the space around it seemed to serve as a public square, and people stood and talked, conducted business, or rested in the shade. She ran her hand over the rough stone walls. The eaves of the shingled roof were so high above her head that she couldn't even touch them. Then she came to one of the long, thin windows and found that instead of being open to the air, it was made of glass. It was as if someone had taken sheets of ice from a lake and fitted them to the stone. She thought it was marvelous. Gunhild worked her way back toward more vendors, and after much consideration decided that she had found what she was looking for. One merchant had a stall selling silver charms and beads of glass, ceramic, and stone. Gunhild recognized some stones as agate and amber. Her eye was drawn to some beads that were pure black and highly polished. She had never seen anything like them. Gunhild reached to touch them, and the vendor, a short, wide man with a bald head and grizzled beard, rose to stop her. Gunhild froze and retracted her hand, and asked instead, "'What is this stone?' "'Jet,' said the man. "'Where is it from?' she asked. "'The jet comes from here, from Northumbria,' the man answered. "'I make the jewelry myself. Do you like it?' "'I do. It's very nice. How much jet do you have?' Why? asked the man skeptically. I would like to buying it, said Gunhild. Or maybe tell me where it is you get this ones? No, no, said the man quickly. You may certainly buy it. Uh, you don't want a necklace? Or this strand that hangs between two brooches? I would love all the jet you have, said Gunhild. The man looked at her suspiciously. Are you buying with silver? he asked. With real coins? 
Gunhild smiled at him and took the lyre from her shoulder. How much will you trade me for this? she asked. The man's shoulders sank, and he looked visibly disappointed. He reached out grudgingly for the lyre, and Gunhild handed it over. He examined it closely and handed it back, then reached inside his cloak behind his back and brought out a leather pouch. Gunhild watched as he opened the pouch, looked inside, and brought out a string of twelve jet beads. He put it on the table in front of him and pushed it toward her. Gunhild looked at the string of beads on the table. "'What is the cost in silver?' she asked. "'That's five pennies worth right there,' he said. "'I'm hoping for more,' she said, indicating the liar. "'But what do I want with that thing?' he asked. "'It has some brass bits on it I could pry off, I guess.' Gunhild took the liar back, offended at the suggestion. She didn't know how much it was actually worth, but it seemed like five pennies, or twelve beads, wasn't nearly enough. It was the only thing of value that she had, and she loved it. She was willing to part with it, though reluctantly, but if all she could get for it was twelve beads, her plan was ruined. "'I will go think,' she mumbled, and pushed the jet beads back toward the merchant. He nodded, and she turned away, trying to keep her breathing even and blinking back tears as she walked off. She found her way back toward the church and sat in the open area in front of it, running through her options. She could give in and take the beads, she could look for another vendor, or she could sail for another port and trade there. As she sat, she watched people pass by. Her experience of the English was limited mostly to the villagers from Straunasha, and that didn't amount to many people. When she took the time to look closely here in Yoverwich, she could start to pick out differences. There was more variety in people's clothes, in their faces, and even in how they walked. Many people here weren't farmers. Some were wealthy. Others were clearly servants. On the front steps of the church, a blind man held out a bowl to passers-by. Four soldiers walked by dressed in chainmail and carrying spears. It was fascinating just to watch the city around her. She was already holding the lyre and began to pluck absent-mindedly at its strings. When she did, some people turned to look, and she stopped again. She had never played for anyone since Edmund's feast, but she realized there was nothing stopping her. If anyone objected, she decided, she would stop and go back to the boat, but maybe they wouldn't object. She checked the tuning, and then began some of her favorite patterns and scales. The effect was subtle but unmistakable. People definitely noticed. Most passers-by continued on their way, but they all looked. Some slowed to listen. Gunhild began to pick out some melodies that she had been working on when she had practiced before. One man stopped and stood before her, staring, and soon others seemed to take that as permission for them to stop too, and soon Gunhild had a small crowd. Eventually she stopped playing and looked up at them, smiling. Was thu hal, she said timidly. Nicely played, said a man, and others by him added their agreement. Do you know the robin on the bow? One onlooker asked, and Gunhild said apologetically that she did not. I know not many songs, she said. I can maybe remember this one. She hummed a bar to find the right notes, then began a song she knew in Danish from her childhood. Some of the audience moved on, but others took their place, and after her song she was encouraged to sing another, and another. After she ran out of songs, she went back to making up melodies. She noticed that a young boy now stood in front of the crowd, and he seemed enraptured. He was dressed in fine clothes and wore soft leather boots that reached to the knee. She smiled at him and kept playing, and he continued to stand even as others moved on, until a voice called out, Dioring! Gunhild stopped playing as a man pushed through the crowd and came to stand by the boy. The man's cloak had a fur collar, and a sword hung from his belt. There you are, said the man. Don't wander off. But father, she's playing that thing, said the boy. It's called a harpa, said Gunhild, smiling. I want to hear more, said the boy. Gunhild was expecting the boy's father to drag him away, but to her surprise, he turned to her. Well, he said, keep playing then. Gunhild continued to play, and tried the song Ofig had taught her long ago. Rolling on the winding river, sailing on the salty sea, storms may shake my little ship, but I'll come home to Mary B. She finished playing and held the lyre out for the boy to see. He took it happily and strummed the strings. He looked up at his father for approval. His father didn't look too impressed, but patted him on the head nevertheless and murmured, Very good. 
May I have it, said the boy. I want to play. The man looked at Gunhild. I don't suppose it's for sale, he said. Uh, the harpa, said Gunhild. It's all I have. Yes or no, said the man. The crowd who had been listening to her continued to watch the conversation. It was the most interesting thing that had happened in the market that day. Gunhild tried to think quickly. She wasn't sure what social customs might figure in here, and she didn't want to seem rude. She knew now that she was talking to someone far above her in status. She also wanted to get the best price possible. I could sell, she said. How much? This seemed to annoy the man who had taken out a leather pouch. You tell me, he said. Clearly he didn't want to haggle. He thinks it's beneath him, Gunhild realized. She tried to think of a price that wouldn't insult him. Thirty pennies, she said. The man paused momentarily, as if considering, then dumped the contents of the bag into his hand and counted out thirty silver coins and handed them to her. The boy was beaming, and when he followed his father away, he clutched the lyre to his chest. Gunhild watched him go and felt a stab of regret. Although she had always been planning to sell or trade the lyre, it was still hard to see it go. As he left, though, the boy looked back over his shoulder and smiled at Gunhild, and she was glad that at least the lyre would go to someone who loved it. She put the coins into the bag that hung from her belt and thought about what to do next. She had already seen all the market stalls and knew that there were some useful things she could buy now that she was able. She got a whetstone for her knife, and she got some sausages because they would keep well for emergency food. She thought hard about some new shoes, as hers had worn right through at the heel, but she decided to save her money. Finally, she returned to the jeweler. "'Changed your mind?' he asked as she approached. "'Yes,' she said, smiling. "'I like those jet beads. I need many.' The man's forehead furrowed as he watched her count out twenty-five silver pennies. "'Sold your harp then, did you?' he asked as he counted out five strands of shiny black beads. "'I guess some people will buy anything.' "'Some people appreciate music more than others,' she said in Danish. The man looked confused, but Gunhild took the beads and smiled and headed back to the river.